Jay Nichols has coined the term blue mind. He's a, this guy's a neuroscientist. He's um, associated with the California Academy of Sciences. Great guy. And Jay has really delved into what it is about ocean and water that is so crucial to humans and human mental and physical health. And one of the things he's learned is that we go through almost a physiological reaction to, to water when we're immersed in it or we're near it, we hear it. And that all of those transitions, all those adaptations that we go through are, are highly beneficial. They lead to a more relaxed state, they lead to more creative thinking, they lead to more uh, just general sense of well-being. We need to connect to the ocean. Um, one of the, the sayings that I have always stuck to is, um, you know, we, we need to take care of the ocean like our lives depend upon it, because they do. Welcome to the Warriors at Work show. This is Gina Coomber, your guide and host. This is a show for men and women in the workplace who want to move from the predictable to the potent. This is your weekly dose of inspiration with an edge. I talk with CEOs and shamans, sports marketing executives and therapists. All of us are like-minded thinkers and doers who tell stories, share wisdom, and challenge each other to have the best life possible inside and outside the office. Welcome to your Warrior Conversation. Hey everybody, it's Jeannie. Thank you so much for joining me at Warriors at Work. Today I'm bringing to you a conversation with President and Chief Executive Officer John Racanelli of the National Aquarium in Baltimore. John leads a diverse organization with a talented team of employees and volunteers, and it's all around pursuing the aquarium's global mission to connect people with nature while inspiring care and compassion for our ocean planet. The National Aquarium is one of the nation's top aquariums. They welcome over 1.2 million guests per year. And John is a visionary in the ocean conservation space and it was an absolute pleasure and privilege to have a conversation with him, hear his perspective on the ocean, nature, and some really, really important projects that the National Aquarium is leading that helps us all. So be inspired, be moved by this conversation, and start to ask yourself more questions about your relationship with nature. Enjoy. John, thank you so much for joining me here at Warriors at Works. I am so thrilled to hear about you, your story, and this incredible work that you're doing in the world. So thank you so much for being here with me. Well, thank you, Jeannie. It's really a pleasure to be here. You know, one of the first things I always like to do is I, I like to hear the backstory uh, that leads to someone being in the space that they're currently in. And you have such an interesting journey from diver and aquarist to president and CEO of the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Tell us your story. How, how did this all come to be? Well, the through line is water. Um, even as a kid, I, I, was, I, was, I was hyper. And the place that I found that really calmed me down and, and enabled me to really kind of even out was in water. And so swimming pools were great for a while, but eventually I needed a bigger platform. And I fell in love with uh, ocean, the ocean at a very early age. I think I was probably body surfing by the age of five or six and snorkeling by the age of eight and surfing and uh, got certified as a scuba diver at the age of 15, which was, I think, at that mm. time, as young as you could be. Um, and so f during all of that time, it was really, that was, the, that was my, my, my sort of comfort place, the place I really wanted to go to. And I lived near the coast, so it, it helped. I was I grew up in California, near the Northern California coastal town of Santa Cruz, and and just just spent my every summer at the beach and much of the winter months in wetsuits and I think I had a bigger wardrobe of wetsuits than clothes for <laughs> a good bit of my my late youth. So that led kind of naturally to my first real summer job, which was as a diver at a marine park on San Francisco Bay called Marine World, and. Um, you know, looking back, I mostly was an underwater janitor, but, uh, we got to dive with, you know, we fed the sharks underwater and we dove with the dolphins and we fixed things in the dolphin exhibit. And, you know, all of that was kind of a precursor, I think, 
uh, while I was going to college. It, it let me realize this was the kind of world that I wanted to work in. Mm. Um, when I got out of school with a business degree, I realized maybe being a diver was not going to be my ultimate, you know, call in life, but, but being in the business of aquariums was. And so, um, I got lucky and landed a job early in my career at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, as a entry level marketing guy. And that graduated fairly quickly, uh, to be the lead of the marketing and development effort. And and was there to launch that aquarium back in the 80s and stayed there for for 10 years. So this mm. progression just continued. And after 10 years, I got recruited to be the CEO of, a, of an aquarium that was being built in Florida. And that led to, uh, you know, even other more significant things in my profession. And um, after seven years there, I went back to California, started my own firm and consulted with aquariums. Um, conservation organizations, even startup businesses in the Bay Area. And that rounded out, I think, mm. uh, a lot of my thinking about how to lead an organization in ways that has helped me a lot in the 13 years since I was um, invited to come here and become the CEO of the National Aquarium, the nation's real model for aquariums. Yeah, so that's I, a long story. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great story, and there's so many, uh, I'm sure, very poignant moments that happened along the way. You know, I I am curious when you were growing up, like being a kid, were you, were you looking at the, you know, Jacques Cousteau's as the, ooh, that's that's who I want to be, that's that's the kind of life I want to have, or were there other people that you were being mm -hmm. exposed to that were really helping inform some of your decisions? I definitely saw all the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau specials. I also, I think I watched probably every episode of Sea Hunt with Mike Nelson, which was a black and white show in that era, or maybe it was in reruns by the time I saw it, but it was still pretty cool. Um, I really started picking up on it when I started reading the work of people like Ken Norris. He's long gone, but he was interestingly... First of all, a, a leading marine scientist of his era, uh, the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, was a, eventually, I, I ended up taking a couple classes from him, from him at UC Santa Cruz, uh, which was great. But he also was one of the founders of SeaWorld and, uh, in oh. the 60s in San Diego. And at that time, they had a very different vision for it than maybe what it is today. But Ken was this amazing guy, and he was a marine mammal expert. And I think really kind of first reading his books and his articles, and then eventually meeting him, and then eventually taking classes from him. And then he was on my board at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, was really an influential guy in my life. The other one was David Packard. The Monterey Bay Aquarium was funded by a single grant of $55 million, which today would be probably $150 million from David and Lucille Packard. And he was the founder of Hewlett Packard and brilliant guy, amazing man. He stood six foot six and was just this imposing figure and certainly the first billionaire I'd ever come across. But more importantly, he was an incredibly thoughtful, um, inquisitive thinker and uh, an engineer by trade, but also a, a big picture guy. And and I learned so much from working alongside of, of him at, at in those early days at the aquarium, which I think he found as interesting, if not more so than HP at that point in his career. Mm. And uh, I, you know, I just learned a lot about, about seeing to your ideas and following them through. And, you know, he was the creator of the concept of managing by one, walking around. And he did that at HP for decades um, he was a believer that, you know, get it done right the first time. So you don't have to keep coming back and, and rebuilding things. So again, a big influence, not as much oceanically, I guess, but all about leadership, which yeah. I think is important too. What an extraordinary opportunity to have access to that level of person and being and so mm -hmm. ahead of their time. That must have been really incredible. It definitely was. It really was. I, I I feel so lucky to have had that early in my in my life in my late twenties. Yeah. So then let's talk about the National Aquarium. So the, the, some of these statistics really blew me away. So you oversee a world that basically attracts thirty five million visits per year, and in the National Aquarium, it's over a million visits per year. Like, what is that like? 
Like what, what, what do you even feel and hear when I say those words? Right. Well, okay. 35 million total impact, yes. uh, total impressions, people yes. out there, mainly social. And then, yeah, 1.2 million people or, or put another way since the opening of the aquarium, 70 million people uh, wow. have, have walked through the aquarium uh, across the street behind me. <clears throat> you know, I think the thing that really means a lot to me is that, um, that we have a compelling vision, um, which is to connect people with nature and in doing so, inspire them to care and have compassion for our ocean planet. And that key word ocean planet is, is crucial. I, I really don't let people think about the planet um, without thinking about the ocean, because after all, we are mostly an ocean. Seventy-seven mm percent -hmm. of this planet is an ocean. As my colleague and friend and wonderful um, inspirer, Dr. Sylvia Earle, often says, they goofed when they named this place. It shouldn't be called Earth. It should be called Ocean. Mm. Um, so, so that mission is really crucial to us in the sense that we create connections between people and nature in a world where it's hard now to get those connections. Um, 70 some percent of the US population lives in urban or suburban areas. So they're really not, 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 in, not naturally finding themselves in contact with nature and natural systems. Um, and yet we are very much a part of nature. So mm. we can't lose sight of that. And that is probably the most compelling part of our work is to make sure that we make that little connection maybe once, maybe twice, maybe 15 times in someone's visit, hopefully in a way that inspires them to continue to do that, um, you know, in their life outside of here. And, and in doing so, remind themselves that, that they belong in, in the natural systems that, that we're all a part of. So that's a crucial one. Um, and that's an awesome responsibility for sure. Mm. I mean, we, do, we don't want to teach them the wrong things. We don't want to over teach them. They come to us not to be taught, but to be engaged and entertained. And we know that entertainment value is 7.5 times more important than educational value in terms of people's overall appreciation for places like ours. So we entertain them in a way that educates them and causes them to feel somehow engaged in that mission and connected with nature. That's, that's, that's when we see that in our data mm -hmm. that we're accomplishing that we know we're on, on mission. You're really evoking an emotion too. So totally. they feel a sense of connectedness to, you know, I'm not just here looking at this beautiful exhibit, but I'm, I'm a part of this system. Absolutely. That is totally true. And, and, mm -hmm. and we are, let's, let's have a few, you know, to, to just a, a few superlatives about the world we live in four and a half, four of the next five breaths that we take every one of us on this planet, every human being, every air breathing mammal are courtesy of the ocean. They're courtesy of the plankton that lives in the top centimeter of the ocean. It's the rainforests are very important. The, our boreal forests are crucial, but all 80% of the oxygen is coming from the ocean. The ocean is taking up the lion's share of the carbon that we produce. It's pulling it into the ocean and sequestering it there instead of in the atmosphere where, where, where it would otherwise make the, the atmosphere less supportive of our life. And it also is the mitigator of, of extreme weather. The ocean is what, stabilizes and normalizes the weather. And of course, as we see more extreme weather events occurring and more frequent, frequently, I think we're, we're seeing what happens as we start to change that, that balance uh, that the ocean really normally brings to the planet. As the ocean gets more acidic, as it gets warmer, it is less capable of maintaining that level of mm. atmospheric and climatic balance. So so there's a lot behind this. It's really important that we get this across to people that our life support system is that ocean out there. And we are tied to it as much as anything on the planet. And as goes the ocean, so go the humans. Are, 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 that is so important. What you just said, I think more than anything is, is our, is our relationship to the ocean. It's not just this thing we get to swim in in the summertime and look at. I have the benefit of living a block from the ocean. So I get to see it's, awesomeness every day. But I think how you just articulated that is so, so important that we not just get it intellectually, but that we feel it so that we stay in action to protect it. And it matters not only to those of us who live on the coast, but also the people that live in the, in the Midwest and in the desert and in the mountains. For everybody, it is a factor um, mm. and it's part of a system. 
and a system that we are influencing. Uh, there's no no doubt about that, and, and you know, science is is very clear on that. And it's also something that we can we can mitigate our impact on, and and that's I think the place we're at right now as a culture and as as a society. Mm. Well, let, let's talk about you for a moment, just in terms of of your leadership. So, you know, as as the president and CEO, you really have to balance so many different constituencies. So you have the needs of the visitors, the volunteers, you have a team, you have a board, not to mention all of the incredible sea life there that's under your uh, your management. Like, what is the leadership approach and philosophy that ties together all of these pieces for you? Sure. I think the first and most important part for me has been always been to establish what our desired future state is. Where are we trying to go here? You know, vision statements at their best are <clears throat> are statements of where, uh, of a direction, but not necessarily a destination. I, you know, the, the, my favorite analogy for a great vision statement is the North Star. You can always see it, at least in this Northern mm -hmm. hemisphere, and it will always steer you North, but you'll never get there. <laughs> um, in a similar fashion, a great vision statement lays out a vision, a statement of where you could be in some period of time, five years, 10 years, and then you build a path towards it and agree upon the results to get there. So that's really the first part of my philosophy is have a vision, a clear definition of your desired future, and then map the results that everybody expects to attain to get there in some kind of intervals, often annual. Then surround yourself with the talent that can do that work, but give them the latitude, the freedom to pursue it in the ways that they best know. Um, I think managing people's methods is, is, is dangerous and kind of deadly and not to mention will drive you crazy because it's too much to look after. Um, but sharing an accountability and giving mm -hmm. people a clear sense of where, agreeing that this is where we're gonna go and then saying, you're the best judge of how we're gonna get there, I think is one of the key components of my, my approach to leadership. Um, I think I also try to really understand, make sure people, we all understand the consequences of success and even failure. Sometimes the consequence of failure is, uh-oh, didn't make your goals, you know, you have to leave. But for the most part, long before that happens, if you've got clarity around results, that's not going to happen. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to figure out what it is that you need to change and mitigate uh, to adapt to changes that might be preventing someone from hitting their goals or a department or a team or a group. And then map to that. Mm -hmm. So there are consequences, but they're not always extreme. And frankly, there are also consequences on the plus side. What are the consequences if we exceed our goals? How can we, how can we share the revenue that might accrue from that? Or what mm -hmm. opportunities might that open for us? So I'm always trying to figure out and, and map out with my team what are what will be the consequences of this this potentiality or that one. I think the last one is just to be. <laughs> To be human, um, <laughs> you know, to be real. Uh, I have never lost sight of my roots, scrubbing those tanks and vacuuming the bottom of the of a four hundred thousand gallon you know reef tank. And so when I walk into that aquarium over there, I I I have a high level of empathy for my people. I know what mm -hmm. they go through, and I care about that, and I want them to know that I I do. And I think any leader needs to demonstrate that whenever they can. And, and, and but it has to be genuine. You have to really believe it, um, and feel it, and take the time to hang out at the staff parties or the going away or coming to parties or the birthday events and just things that that our team celebrates. That that it, it, it's sometimes okay for the CEO to show up at least for a little while. I, yeah, too long. They need to be able to have some fun <laughs> out there, but. It's so interesting to to hear you reflect on all of those things from a leadership perspective. And and my mind immediately goes to, you know, you, you had an opportunity to have exposure to the, the person behind um, HP, which is pretty extraordinary. When, when you think back on your career, you know, everybody always likes to, to look at like key pivotal moments, something that really was either a watershed moment or just something where you're like, I'm about to shift gears. When I ask you that question, is is there a memory that comes to mind that you really feel was the most influential that leads to kind of where you sit right now and what you're thinking, what you're feeling? 
There are a couple. Yeah, there are. Um, and certainly, you know, spending time, actually, the first time I ever met David Packard, that was certainly one of them. Um, I would say that even before then, though, there were a couple other moments in my life where I, I started to get a glimpse of where I was supposed to be. The first was uh, a sabbatical I took, one of one of a few, <laughs> during my long, elongated college career. Um, <laughs> I took off during the U.S. Bicentennial. I was 20 and sailed on a tall ship from the West Coast to the East Coast uh, through the Panama Canal. And it was about 6,000 miles by sea. And I was the navigator and I was 20. And when I got on the ship, I didn't know how to navigate by the stars. I didn't have any idea how to do celestial navigation, but um, I picked it up quickly. And in fact, was a better navigator than the captain who was a retired Navy guy, um, but who never really got the knack of using a sextant, which is a very fairly complex instrument you have to use on a bobbing ship at sea with a timepiece and almanacs. And this was before we had computers that could do it all in our in our palm, let alone GPS. Um, every day, I was the guy responsible for figuring out where the ship was and, and, and letting the crew know. And it was a real kind of heady thing for me because I realized this is, a, not only do I possess this sort of power of you know, knowing where we are on a ship in a featureless ocean, but more importantly, I'm I'm bringing really important information to these people, and and I got to get it right. I got to get it right so that they feel comfortable about the progress we're making. Um, that was pretty exciting, and I I took away from that a, 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 first of all just a great appreciation for the vastness of the ocean. Um, there were you know there was 13 day period where we never saw another ship or shoreline, and um, only our little tiny little floating microcosm sailing across the ocean was was our whole world. And it gave me a sense both of how tiny we are on this planet mm. and let alone this you know universe, and also how much we can influence our future if we get it right and stay on course. And that whole navigational metaphor has stuck with me through the rest of my years. I, I, I still view life in a similar fashion. Map out your course ahead, pay attention to the markers and the signs along the way, Try not to screw it up <laughs> and get to your destination. So, so that, <laughs> that was crucial. I also took some time to uh, uh, go off. I needed to raise some money to finish college. So I went up to Alaska um, later in the 70s. And I uh, worked as a, a deckhand, a fisherman on a king crab fishing vessel in the Bering Sea. And um, it was nothing like, I mean, it was no glamour. You know, the TV show that came many years later sort of glamorized that and it's cool that they did, but it was definitely, there were no TV shows. You were just out there in these very, very extreme conditions. And I think the thing that struck me was not so much the bounding main and all that, that was cool, but it was really that we took too many crabs out of that sea. In the year I was there, it was 85 million pounds. And I remember thinking, how can we possibly take that many king crabs out of the sea without wiping out the population of king crabs? Well, we could, and we did. And in the 80s, the king crab market fell completely. And then later, with better management, the state of Alaska kind of brought that back to a, a, a condition of, of balance. But I remember thinking, all right, there are limits to what humankind can take out of and put into something as vast as the ocean. And we need to pay attention to those. Mm. And I, I brought that with me into my life as a conservationist. Um, that that it doesn't mean we have to slam the door and can't touch, but just be more thoughtful about how we impact natural systems. Um, you know, if you love to fish, great fish. Throw back the little ones. Maybe keep one for dinner tonight. Um, mm. You don't need to catch 50 fish and kill them all. You know, it, it, it's a lot more fun to put them back and, you know, maybe take one home and and, and make a meal of it for your family and your, and your, your kids. But so it's, it's really about understanding, you know, the value of conservation. And, and that all started in that experience in Alaska. Wow. So later, when I got to Monterey and got to meet a guy like David Packard, I think I was kind of preconditioned to be, you know, a science advocate and a believer in the value of conserving the resources on our planet. Well, it's a perfect segue into what you're known for in terms of your leadership brand, particularly around innovation. I mean, you've, you've, 
been instrumental in developing things like the Dolphin Sanctuary, Floating Wetland, just to name a, a few things. I, I'd love some insight into your perspective and your take on innovation. So when that word comes up in discussion, where does your mind go? You know, I think innovation is about it's about creating, taking risks. It's about being bold. Um, it's about, you know, striking out and sometimes maybe failing, but moving on to the learning that that created for you. You know, everybody, there's a misnomer about the business I'm in. The National Aquarium, like almost all major aquariums in the country, is is a nonprofit organization. But the IRS actually identifies us as not for profit organizations. And there is a distinction here. Mm. Um, we, we make a profit. I mean, we have an operating surplus each year and we roll that back into our operation in, term, in, in, in the context of capital improvements um, and, and long term planning and, and, and need, meeting those needs. So we're, we're not for profit, but when we have profit, we use profit for the benefit of the organization. And that's a fairly entrepreneurial um, approach that we take. We want to maximize that return as much as we can. And I think these days in the nonprofit realm, it's important to be entrepreneurial. And some organizations are doing that better than others. In, in the case of the National Aquarium, in spite of our name, we don't receive uh, funding from the, from the federal government. We don't receive operating support uh, from the federal government. And we receive a very limited percentage of support from any, any government, state, city, local, whatever. Um, so we have to be fleet footed. We have to be a, a nimble organization and innovation is therefore really kind of in our DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, an example of that would probably be the wonderful, cool Harbor wetland project that we're now building that will open in uh, the summer of 2024 and is a, um, uh, a completely new idea, the floating wetlands on the water that actually create a habitat for the animals and a cool sort of floating park for the public and contribute to improve water quality because the plants take nutrients out of the, out of the harbor. And um, designing that and prototyping it and getting it out on the water, which it is now in the process of being, uh, was quite a process and quite a, a creative enterprise. And we discovered that the way we were doing it has never been tried before. So we um, pursued a patent and it's now a patent pending technology. And we think that we can probably license this technology to other cities who want to improve their waterfronts, but want a medium upon which these plants can grow that will survive for 30 to 40 years, as opposed to the two or three years that, that so-called floating wetlands make survive nowadays. They really don't last long because they, they collapse, they kind of sink under their own weight as the biomass of the plants grows and grows and the flotation capacity is over uh, is exceeded. So that's an example of an innovation that we started because we thought, hey, this is a good idea. And we've now mm -hmm. uh, developed into something that might prove to be a marketable um, you know, product for, for the future. I think it's important to just keep asking, is there a better way forward? Mm -hmm. That's that's really the guiding philosophy for, for me and for many of our people here. Um, what other ways might we go if, if indeed this method didn't work? Because this concept for floating wetlands that we came up with was after five prototypes and a whole lot of, you know, false starts. But I think in every adversity, there's always an opportunity. And, mm -hmm. and if you fail not, if you fail to, to, to kind of take the time to look for the opportunity, well, you're just missing out on opportunities that I think could prove to be the great solution that overcomes the adversity that started it. Um, that's a that's a guiding principle for me and always has been. And what are what are the initiatives and new things that you're looking at right now that you really feel are going to advance the mission? So that harbor wetland is really one um, because it it really shows that we can have a, an industrialized commercialized harbor that has been you know in human kind of control for centuries now here in Baltimore mm. and frankly in many other cities throughout the eastern seaboard throughout the world <clears throat> but they can also be a healthy you know um, uh, vivacious ecosystem that is providing for the animals that that otherwise live there that might have lived there before and that can live there now and I think what we're proving is the inner harbor is actually a fairly healthy place for animals and 
we can do a lot better. And that's what we're trying to do with this. But it's another example of that. And it delivers on our mission to, again, mm. create those connections with nature for people. They're going to see great blue herons and blue crabs molting and, you know, stripers, rockfish in the shallows. Uh, it, it, all these things that happen throughout the Chesapeake Bay, but are often not seen in a hard edged concrete urbanized harbor. Um, all of our exhibits, we really try to create ecosystems. We try to create replications of the real world so that when people come here, they get a sense of how all these animals live together in communities, in, in socialized communities and uh, aggregations, not redfish, bluefish, you know, mm -hmm. sharks here, rays there. So with all of our exhibits, as we continue to modernize the National Aquarium, um, in its 40 plus years of life, we move towards more habitat based exhibits, which leads to another innovation we're working on, which is to evolve uh, the experience for our dolphins. We've had dolphins here at the National Aquarium since the 1990s. They live in a big, roomy, giant tank, but it is still a tank. It's not a habitat in the sense that uh, maybe all the other animals in the aquarium get to enjoy. It's not, they don't, the black tip reef provides the reef sharks with a habitat that very closely mirrors the world they come from, the Indo-Pacific. Um, Australia is a riverbed that as if you've kind of pulled the water out and shown the dry season. They, uh, they, of course, the Amazon rainforest is a spectacular recreation of a rainforest with trees and birds and plants and sloths and reptiles. So mm. <clears throat> in the case of the dolphins, they have the best care they could possibly get in the setting we provide. And their lives are rich. They have great welfare. And we've also learned that we can probably do better. And doing better means providing them with more space, more opportunities to uh, socialize and form social bonds and have the choice and control that they would have in the real world. And that means being in ocean water. So we're looking at options to develop them a sanctuary in the tropics and to move them there within three years. And uh, in doing so, I think giving them a whole new lease on their lives to let them be more the kind of animal that nature has has, has evolved them towards for the last 18 million years, you know, hundreds of times longer than human evolution. Mm. Um, and in doing so, open up some space right here on our piers here in the harbor in Baltimore to interpret the ocean world in, in new ways to our public and to find new ways to engage um, our guests and our students in this community and elsewhere and everybody else that we touch. So there's, it just, it creates a kind of a, a synergistic effect that, that, that benefits people in Baltimore, even as it benefits dolphins who might be living in the tropics in another few years time. Um, one of the things we do in the building where they live today, but in a limited sense, because we're limited by space, is rescue of animals that need help from humans. So we rescue, rehabilitate, and release, oh, anywhere between 15 and 40 uh, endangered turtles, sea turtles every year. <clears throat> we also rescue and release seals, gray seals, harp seals. Um, currently have a few of those guys in-house, um, hopefully getting better every day so we can take them back to the beach and give them a new lease on life. So all of these are ways that we collectively uh, try to benefit the, the natural environment here on site and are, are again, you know, ways that we, we can kind of innovate and grow uh, our impact. And, and all of those examples remind me of what you said when we first started is, is our relationship to the ocean and our relationship to nature. And, and one of the things you said to me when we were preparing for this conversation, you said the aquarium offers a place to heal. Yeah. And when you were describing some of those things, I just had this vision of you kind of walking through. Do you walk through the aquarium and oh, just gosh, yes. just okay. kind of be present to mm -hmm. all of the things that you're leading the organization through, like to to create a little bit of separation from being the CEO, but being among what you're creating and what you're a part of? I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that from like an experiential point of view. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, a good uh, colleague of mine, Wallace J. Nichols has coined the term blue mind. 
and 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 he's a this guy's a neuroscientist. He's um, associated with the California Academy of Sciences. Great guy, and Jay has really delved into what it is about the ocean and water that is so crucial to humans and human mental and physical health. And one of the things he's learned is that we go through almost a physiological reaction to to water when we're immersed in it or we're near it, we hear it. And that all of those transitions, all those adaptations that we go through are, are highly beneficial. They lead to a more relaxed state. They lead to more creative thinking. They lead to more um, just general sense of well-being and capacity. Um, so we know that aquariums unique among all museums and zoos and other cultural attractions have this additional benefit for people that water is a comforting and soothing um, kind of sensation for humans. We have a lot of waterfalls in our aquarium in part because of that. And we've even talking about kind of identifying places where, you know, you can really kind of delve into your blue mind if you stay right in this spot for five minutes. Um, you know, we've talked about, I think I might've mentioned to you that, you know, we need, we, we need, we need to connect to the ocean. Um, one of the, the sayings that I have always stuck to is, um, you know, we, we need to take care of the ocean like our lives depend upon it because mm -hmm. they do. As I said earlier, you know, the whole notion of, the, of, of aquatic systems, oceans, to a lesser extent, but very much an important extent, lakes and rivers and um, other freshwater bodies, they are what we're relying upon to, to stay healthy. And, and they need us and we need them. And aquariums are the window into that world. And I think for me, that's um, that's really one of the, the keys. What what brings me back every day to to work and feeling enthused and excited about it, even after these many decades in this profession. We have a lot of work left to do, but it's exciting to see the impact we have on people. Mm. Um, and 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 this whole new dimension of awareness that we've created. Pretty much, yeah. There were a few great fish palaces in Europe and in the U.S., but really took off when this aquarium launched in the 1980s, followed quickly by that other aquarium on the West Coast, my alma mater, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and now an entire industry throughout the world that continues to, uh, the wave that continues to wash out towards Asia and Africa and other continents that have not yet had that same level of uh, awareness about ocean and aquatic systems. You know, I'm curious when you talked about the industry too, how, how are you staying connected and relevant to this constant evolution of this, of this world? You know, I, I, I take my inspiration from a variety of places. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, people like Jay Nichols and his, his work. I do try to pay attention to, to um, as you said, to just the way we our, our public response to us. We do a lot of data gathering, both among the public that isn't here and also among the guests that are here. And their insights are often fascinating to me. It's just amazing to see the kind of thinking that people have, and especially kids. Um, so, so for me, seeing and hearing a lot of that is something that really is important to me. Um, I'm a continuous learner, so I'm always trying to read about the latest revelations, um, especially around conservation science. Also a new sensation for me, I'm also thinking about, you know, succession. Um, mm. I'm, 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 I'm young enough to know that the days that I wanna keep doing this at this intensity are not forever. And so as I look at the team around me, I'm learning a lot from them as they emerge as the people who are going to lead this and other aquariums, you know, around the country, uh, in the decades to come. So I'm, I'm, I learn as much from the people around me that I've hired to fill, mm. to fulfill their work as I do from any other source. And I think that's a, that's a bottomless resource. Yeah. So my final question for you is I, I want you to look out into the future five years from now, how will you know that you and your team's efforts have had an impact? You know, I think it starts with, again, you can't manage what you don't measure or put in a more positive mm -hmm. context what you measure, you can manage and lead. And I think um, being able to, to, to pay attention to all the different aspects of how we influence people, whether it's their commitment to do their part to be 
uh, you know, a conservation minded person or their willingness to vote for enlightened laws and principles that that are good for uh, the planet and good for the ocean. Um, I think it's signing on to the idea that you know, this, is, this, is, this is a global phenomenon and a healthier ocean equals healthier human beings. We are absolutely inextricably tied. And I think the thing that we have to come to terms with is the fact that the planet itself has been here for 4.5 billion years. It probably has a few billion more good years in it. We could stay on for the ride for a good bit of that if we do the right things. But if we don't, as the futurist and designer Buckminster Fuller said way back in the past century, you know, on Spaceship Earth, there are many experiments. We're, we're not the only one. So mm. we don't want our experiment to fail here. <laughs> we have a, a chance to be the ones who figured out what was good for ourselves and as well as for the planet. And I think repair our, sadly, I do think of it right now as our broken relationship with nature. Um, our feeling that, 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 you know, we're somehow apart from it instead of a part of it and mm -hmm. kind of get back to finding our place. So that's why our vision um, is about uh, creating a, a global movement of what we call hopeful conservationists united to restore our planet. Mm. And hopeful conservationist means people that have conservation at the, at the core of their kind of belief structure who are full of hope. <laughs> so they're hopeful. And, and we believe in hopefulness. Um, again, I share that with my colleague, Sylvia Earle, who has designed a series of hope spots around the world that are places important enough to, to, to really represent a, a healthier future for our planet. We're committed to the dream of 30% mm -hmm. of the world, both ocean and land, in protected status by the year 2030, which at last count wow. was six years out and counting down. We can get there globally um, if we can make this a true movement. And I believe we will. I really stand behind that idea, that vision. I think it's a it's a worthy one. I think it's one that can actually do right by, by the planet as well as by this wonderful and enigmatic mm. species that we are called homo sapiens. Wow. What a great way to end this conversation. Um, I'm so grateful that you're in the seat that you're in, that you're doing this, uh, this work and, and how insightful you've been in sharing all of your wisdom, all of your experiences and some really important messages here for all of us to take on board. So John, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jeannie. And I enjoyed the opportunity to talk and I sure appreciated some really insightful questions. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Warriors at Work show. If you are interested in learning more about what we do at the Warriors at Work show and platform, be sure to go over to my website, Jeannie Coomber, and subscribe to my monthly Warrior Playbook newsletter. I share everything that I'm up to month by month, as well as some lessons and insights that I've learned. I'm also interested in hearing any feedback you have about this conversation or future topics. So reach out to me directly on jc at jeanniecoombert.com or on LinkedIn. Be sure to tell your friends and your colleagues about this Warriors at Work conversation. Subscribe, review, and rate us. It's the best way to get this message out into the world. Be well.